What is going on, everybody? I hope you are having an awesome week. I mean, it is finally Friday. And this is, again, I look forward to this all week when I get to hang out with my friend, Mike Grobel. And we just talk, we just have a little, a little fireside chat just about all the things that are going on in the photo industry. How are we doing today, Mr. Grobel? I am doing well. How are you? Excellent, excellent. I am pumped. I'm hyped, and we got a pretty good, pretty good, well-rounded uh, show for us today. We uh, have some great rumors. We have some good news, and we have some awesome inspiration because that's the goal of this uh, live stream: is to not only inform you of what's going on, but also to share with you, you know, all the things that are going on in the photo industry, industry, and inspire you to be better, be a better photographer, be a better videographer. So let's see who is joining us today. We have Mr. Brett Giddings. Hello. He was first. I, I love that. First, <laughs> uh, we have uh, Mike Giuliano. Happy Friday, everybody. Hello. Hello. We have Mr. Jim Summers. So glad it's Friday. Football and barrel racing this weekend. Let. So I'm, I don't know if that's a let's get it on or a let's get it on. I, I, it's hard for me to see which one it is without <laughs> having some inflection. Mike Giuliano is usually that guy. Mr. Mike Vrobel is excited about that barrel racing. And then our this might actually be our first uh, Twitch comment from Mr. Sky Carball, and that is the <gasps> emoji. So thank you for tossing that in there. So let's go ahead and get started with today's show, and we're going to do that with our creator of the week. So uh, at JWL Street, uh, he tagged us with, or he used the hashtag, uh, the Pixel Connection, and then tagged us as well. And uh, his street photos around Cleveland are really freaking cool. He's also a Fuji shooter. Uh, he's a member of the Ohio Fuji fam group. Uh, but his stuff, it's just really cool to see. There's this edginess to it. And then also like the story that goes along with it. So for example, this dude cracked me up. He tried to jump into one of my photos and then straight stopped and went into his phone. Let me grab the shot I wanted in the first place. I showed him and he took a photo of the photo. So it's just this story of this gentleman <laughs> who wanted to be a part of the photo, uh, but also just the lines that are in this. I mean, compositionally, like, I guess I'm um, like as a landscape and travel photographer, like I can walk up to a train track per se. And those, you know, we have those lines that are there. He's doing this stuff on the street. So again, d definitely take a look at jwl.street uh, for, you know, some cool inspiration about, you know, in and around the Cleveland area when it comes to street photography. So I also want to let you know that the Talking Pixels podcast is now officially on the Instagram. We have the IG account. Uh, 15 followers is all we have. We need your help, everybody. We need you to jump over there and follow along with us. Uh, and that is the Instagram account for our podcast that we do bi-weekly. And that's all about the business of photography. And we talk about you know how a photographer can start at the beginning and work their way up to take their from the hobby, from a hobby to a career. So take a look at that for sure. A few housekeeping notes here at the store. We are open from 10 to 7 on Monday through Friday and 10 to 6 on Saturday. We have customer, the curbside pickup available, as well as free shipping on thousands of items here at the store. And here at the store, we are making sure everything is clean and disinfected so we can make your shopping experience uh, very comfortable. So let's get into our goals for today. Number one is to update you on the photography related news that you might have missed. Again, there's a lot going on in this crazy world and a lot of times the photography stuff does not make it above the fold. So that is our job to bring it to you each and every week above the fold, all the stuff about the photo industry. It's also our goal to pull you away from the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's going on in your life. Photography has this way to bring you in, to bring you away from those stressful things and get you lost into this work where you can create art. So that's our goal too, is just to remind you that you have this hobby each and every week. And then finally, get you motivated to try something new, something outside of your comfort zone. And again, that's where the magic happens. That's where real growth happens is when you get outside of your comfort zone. We did have a few other people uh, join us, so I wanted to give them a quick shout out. The Moosinator uh, gives us that emoji as well as letter Q. Hello and thank you for joining the live stream today. So let's get into the news. So first and foremost, we have Sony Countdown Timer teases a new concept set to be announced 
next week. So get us up to speed, Mr. Vrobel. Uh, what does this have to do with? So this looks like it is the oft-rumored Sony A7C. They're full frame uh, in the rangefinder body style of their APS-C cameras. Uh, I believe it's coming next Monday, but someone may need to check my math because the crossing of the dates with the UTC and the JTC and the PTC got me kind of confused. But yes. uh, we will find out for sure what's happening, I believe, Monday night at about 9 our time, if I'm doing the math right. Uh, the rumors are it's basically the A7 III pushed into a rangefinder body with a flippy screen. So we got a 24 Which, megapixel sensor, flip out screen, all the stuff that's in the a7 III, just in a more compact form. And absolutely. for about and the, the same price from what I've seen. Successful. Yeah, it's going to say it's been such a successful camera that, you know, they're able to do this. The rumor is it's going to be a little bit less, little bit less expensive, not a lot less expensive. Uh, but they're making that smaller form factor and taking that screen and some of the features from the A7S III and putting them into this body. So again, if you've been on the fence about you know the camera, you know some of the things you might not like about the current A7S III, maybe that's the you know you can't use the touch screen or you want a fully articulating screen or the color science. You know those are all the things that are now fixed in this smaller, lighter weight body and this new concept is more of the rangefinder design correct that's what's been rumored so far yeah that's that seems to be what they're talking about unless you know unless sony alpha rumors is uh, messing up on us again in which case who knows what's coming but uh, i'm i'm kind of kidding with that there are just too many things being leaked right now like spec sheets and and actually they a body picture was released with the new silver top plate to it and I'm normally a fan of silver top plates, but that just looks a little weird to me. The black yeah. body looked better than the silver one, which is not my usual reaction to these things. But yeah, I mean, this has got to be what they're releasing. There's just too much smoke here for that not to be the fire. Absolutely. So it'll be coming very soon today. You know, we have about, what, four days uh, until this happens. So again, it'll be exciting to see what is new for all the Sony Alpha users that are out there. And hopefully it's a, you know, it's just answering what they've wanted for a long time. The biggest thing being a, a flippy screen, a fully articulating yep. screen. So yeah, Fujifilm announces, what's that? I said, I think that'll be big with video shooters. I know I've, on my Fuji, I've been waiting for it till the X-G4. I'm sure the Sony shooters are the same way. Absolutely. And speaking of those Fuji shooters, it looks like we're going to see a little delay. So Fujifilm announces possible <laughs> XF 50 millimeter F 1.0 shipping delay due to demand by ex exceeding their expectations. So we talked about this on the show last week because last week is when it was launched, unless everything's merging together. Um, but we did get hands on with this lens. So if you want to see a little bit more information about it, you can head over to our YouTube channel, The Pixel Connection. And you'll be able to see our full um, video about it. And then also, if you go to our website, thepixelconnection.com, we do a whole blog post where we have a ton of example images breaking down side by side with other lenses. So if you want to take a look at that, please go ahead. So my question on this article for you is, is this the new, is this the new norm in what we're to expect from manufacturers going forward? And this is a loaded question in that, I mean, are they using this as a marketing term or supply chain, you know? And is this gonna be the new norm of huge delays for new products that are coming out? Um, do you think that, you know, manufacturers are being a little bit more conservative in their forecasting? What are your thoughts? So I think this was, again, conservative forecasting, I think is the answer. Uh, I think Fuji thought this would be a popular lens, but, I've, I, I mean, as a Fuji shooter, I'm really excited about this lens and I really want it soon and I'm disappointed to hear that there might be delays, but I'm also not surprised because I've there is more interest in this lens out there uh, on the interwebs and on YouTube than in any Fuji lens I've seen in the last two or three years. And uh, so I'm, I'm not surprised that it's that popular. But apparently Fuji's a little surprised that it's that yeah. popular. I, I get the impression they got burned with their 20 millimeter F2 that they were expecting more demand for that one. So maybe they thought this is a high-end lens. Maybe it'll be a limited market. Let's not get too crazy with how many of these we, we order. 
and then everybody came out of the woodwork wanting this lens. It looks like it's going to be the new standard portrait lens for Fuji cameras, and there's a lot of portrait shooters on Fuji cameras. So I think I think Fuji got blindsided by the demand. Absolutely, and, and I I hope that it is conservative forecasting. I hope that it is them being very conservative in production. Uh, what I don't want to happen is just this, you know, artificial scarcity because, and, and I can say from like the camera store and dealer perspective that the supply chain is 100% messed up. I mean, COVID has wrecked the supply chain, especially earlier on, but you have to remember with, you know, manufacturing, how it works is a lot of these lenses that we're seeing shortages now, you know, were the effect of the March, April, May shutdowns of a lot of the factories. So, you know, we were thinking there for a long time, oh, we're still doing good. We're still getting shipments. Everything's good. But now we're starting to see that ship, you know, the stuff that was stateside that was a little more, you know, a little more plentiful before is no longer. And we're really starting to feel a lot of the shipping issues. I mean, there's stuff that we ordered months ago that still hasn't showed up. So I can say there is some truth to the um, supply chain. Uh, I just hope that it's not an artificial, you know, this artificial demand, you know, creating demand uh, like other companies have done in the past. Yeah. Well, I and again, I may be overgeneralizing from Sony, but I saw an interview recently with one of so Sony's camera um, executives where they were asked that question, you know, is how is the supply chain? And they said that there was a blip back in February, March, April when this was first happening, but all of their factories in, I believe it is, uh, it's in China and their other one is Thailand, I believe, but they are all back to full staff and full production now. So they, they had some slowdown, but they, Sony believes they've caught up. I'm hoping the same is true for Fuji. Absolutely. And all the other vendors for sure. So moving on. So Canon releases a major firmware update for the EOS R6 to improve overheating. Uh, R5 gets a minor update. <laughs> so what do we have here? So it's been uh, a couple weeks now that the R6 has been out. And it seems like we already have, this would be the second firmware update, right? Because wasn't there one right out of the gate? I don't remember if there was, I, there was one right out of the gate for the R5 for the heating issue. And it feels like this is, which was the 1.1 for the R5. And it feels like this is the R6 getting that same fix where they've you know, adjusted which sensors they're using to, to determine heating in the camera. Uh, and I, I'm not sure the, the point, the 1.1 is probably, you know, bug fix and other improvements as we always get in any one of these. But yeah, this feels like the R6 is catching up to the fixes that were put into the R5 for the heating issues. Yep. And as a, you know, with other manufacturers, I might be a little more lax in like if it was Fuji, Panasonic, Olympus, uh, Sony, people who, you know, these camera companies that have done firmware updates on cameras on a regular basis very often, you know, I would have no problem recommending, you know, a firmware update. Uh, but for a new camera like this um, and a new system with Canon, I might wait a couple days uh, to see, you know, to, just to make sure all the bugs are kind of shaken out. Um, but then I would definitely be doing the upgrade, especially if you are experiencing any heating issues with your R6. And we have had a couple customers um, that got their R6s that, you know, hadn't experienced some of these issues with overheating. Um, mm -hmm. But it's been primarily been video related, uh, not exactly photo related. Right. Yeah, it feels like you know, Canon designed these as photo cameras, and that resulted in some design limitations. And people who are expecting them to be full-time video cameras are disappointed, but that's not what Canon was really shooting for. Now, you know, that said, I'm sure they're going to work on this for the R6S or R7 or whatever the next one is. But I think asking for everything in these bodies you know, for someone at Canon was a little too much. And, you know, they, they are great photo cameras. And if you need to do some hybrid video shooting, go for it. They'll, they'll do good, especially with this firmware update. Apparently, it takes you from about 40 minutes of 4K 24P to about 115 minutes of 4K 24P. And that feels to me like the line where I would go from, oh, I'm worried about it to, oh, okay, I'll be fine. I can shoot for an hour. Right. So nice update. And that's actually a pretty big deal. I mean, they were able to get that much more runtime out of that camera. So there's being very conservative out of the gate. 
Cool. Moving right along. I uh, wanted to let everybody know the um, Sig you get a free Sigma uh, 45 F 2.8 with the pre-order of the S5. And again, this is something that's been in the news all week. Um, I actually watched a video about it. Um, it. I fell for the clickbait. And it was like, you can get the new S5 for X amount of dollars. And it was like, wait, how is that already sale? What now? So I clicked on it, and they were just taking into account the cost of the um, the Sigma lens that you get free. So if you pre-order, so if you went to our website and just did the pre-order for the S5, uh, the body only, it actually comes with a free Sigma 45 millimeter F2.8. And that's done via just a mail-in mail -in rebate, gets shipped directly to you. Um, and then also the same with the kit. So again, for 2,300 bucks, you're getting a full frame camera that does you know, 4K, 60 frames. It has an amazing imaging sensor on it, in-body image stabilization, dual image. I mean, they, I mean, the perfect well-balanced camera. And you also get two lenses with it for 2,300 bucks. Like, and that 45 is super, super small, lightweight. I mean, it's the perfect connection. The, those two lenses are the perfect kit for the Panasonic S5. So I definitely, we wanted to let you know that those are available. When we did our coverage, it wasn't necessarily clear. Um, and even when we brought it up last week, I just wanted to remind people that that is available. Yeah, and I, I wanted to follow up on the S5 a little because I feel like I came off very negative about it last week due to the depth from defocus focusing issues, uh, which, spoiler alert, we'll be talking about that a little more in a minute. But this at $2,000, this is a great full-frame camera. And as a former GH5 user, this S5 is, you know, a couple years ago is what I would have been looking at if I was upgrading my cameras. And that Sigma lens is a great lens. I, that would be the L mount lens I would be looking at if I was getting into the L mount Alliance. But uh, I've, my question back to you, and this was something we talked about a little in our after show yes, last week was, what do you think the S5 does to the S1? The, the S5 is cheaper. It's basically the same sensor. It's got the flippy screen on it. And it feels like Panasonic is eating their own low end of the market here. Do you think the S1 will continue to exist? Or what, what are your thoughts on what Panasonic is trying to do here? Yeah, so I think there's definitely a place in the marketplace for both of them. Now, is your are you going to see as much velocity with the S1 as you had in the past? No. I think S5 is definitely going to be that... Um, velocity skew where, you know, a lot of people are going to look at that as, you know, I don't really need the screen on the top. Um, I don't want, you know, a bigger camera. You know, that's where the S5 is really going to come through and, you know, be that solid option. Now, there are people that just like having a bigger full frame size camera. I mean, they like the feel or the size of like the, you know, Mark IV or the D850, you know, they like that bigger camera in their hand. So, you know, I think that there is still a market for that, but I, I think it's a bit of a niche market at this point, what they've done with the S5. Um, I think if they would have launched with the S5, um, it would have been a whole different story for Panasonic. I think that they got a lot of negative press for the size of the S1 and S1R when they came out. Um, and now that the S5 is out, I think that they've done a lot of things, you know, very right. Now, the S1R, I think, is still going to coexist without issue right. because that's going to be your higher megapixel. That's going to be, you know, it's going to be able to take advantage of the XQD cards and, you know, that fast write speed. And, again, it's going to do a great job. Um, but S1, I think that we're going to see, we're not going to see as many people going in that direction. And then S1H is kind of in a league of its own. I mean, it's the right. only Netflix to camera at that price point um, I, I, it's just it's a killer video camera so I don't I don't think that it has any competition there the s1h doesn't so I think that Panasonic really had to do this I think they are listening to their users wanting a smaller camera um, I think that you know the s1 still gonna be there just not as many yeah yeah and I, I agree with your your summary that you know the s1r is the pro photographer really durable really weather resistant body the s1h is the pro videographer body and the new s5 is the low end prosumer body for anyone who wants to get into the l mount system and 
I think Panasonic is doing a really smart thing here, which is the phrase, you know, kill your darlings, where the S1 is a good camera, but they saw that if they didn't make the S5, you know, someone else would and was going to you know, eat their lunch. So they are intentionally pushing out the low end of their market with their own replacement, which is tough to do, especially when you've put the kind of effort I'm sure they did into the S1, but it's it's the right move for a business is, you know, you want to be the one that replaces your low end, not somebody else. So good for Panasonic for making a tough decision here. Yeah, and continuing on with um, Panasonic, and we talked a little bit about this pre-show, um, but coming into focus, how Panasonic's DFD gamble may yet pay off. So, um, Mike, what is DFD? So DFD is depth from defocus, where Panas the normal quote-unquote focusing system is phase detect, where there are two different pixels on the sensor, and each of those pixels is basically a half pixel. It's only seeing half of the lens, one pixel on the right and one pixel on the left. And they use that to triangulate. They form a triangle from that, and that tells them how far apart whatever it is they're looking at is, and that's how they focus. And that phase detect focus is what Canon has had for years that has made them killer in video focus. Um, depth from defocus is essentially two different pictures taken, and they use the De the Panasonic is basically making a depth map from those pictures, and they're you, they're, they take a picture, they change the focus just a tiny bit, and then they take another picture, and they use the depth difference that they can calculate between those two pictures to focus. And this has the advantage of it doesn't have to use half pixels. It can use full pixels, so the image quality is better. It's also blazingly fast for photos. It's a really quick way to instantly snap the photo into focus. The problem is, is that for video, they have to be doing that constantly. And that's where you get that weird wobble in the background sometimes in the depth from the focus cameras where the lights seem to pulse. It's because they're doing the, well, we have to shift the focus just a little, take the picture, and then, you know, th then we know where we're at. And the interesting thing is the S5 has made a lot of improvements in that. The, the reviews seem to say it is much better about this, but it's not there yet. It's not Canon or Sony level. What I found interesting about this article from DP Review is they're saying that Panasonic is making a bet that depth from defocus, because it is sensor and processor based, the better the tech in the camera, the better the hardware, the quicker that depth from defocus happens. And they would rather wait for the technology to catch up to where it is so fast that you can't tell the difference between it and phase detect and not lose the picture quality that you lose with phase detect. And it's an interesting bet. You know, computer technology is constantly advancing. Chips are always getting faster. Sensors are always getting better. Panasonic is betting that they will get better enough that very soon the depth from defocus doesn't focus well enough story that they have to fight against Canon and against Sony will solve itself. And I, I worry about that bet because depth from defocus has always been the weakness to the Panasonic cameras, at least in the press. I hope that they're right and that they can get this solved just through throwing hardware at it sooner rather than later. What are your thoughts Absolutely. on this? I was going to say, so a couple things on that. Number one is, you know, I I would agree with the, oh, first and foremost, you, I'm going to start with the, you know, this idea that just the Panasonic just can't autofocus. And a lot of this has been video related. So if you're looking for a still camera, remember, you know, YouTube is a very video centric platform and that's where, you know, a lot of cameras are reviewed for their video prowess more than stills, I feel. So I definitely urge you to try it for yourself. Um, but for stills, I mean, it does, uh, it's super, super snappy. I mean, I, you know, think back to using my G9 and just how snappy it really was. And I would agree with Panasonic with the keeping with DFD for the micro four thirds lineup. I mean, it makes sense. I don't want to take light capturing pixels and use them for autofocus. I'm already on a smaller mm -hmm. sensor, so that would just kill my low light performance, which smaller sensors sometimes get dinged for. So I would agree with keeping that DFD all day long. Um, depth from defocus, it's, you know, 
I love the idea behind the technology. They profile the depth profile for all of their lenses and that information is actually loaded into their lenses. So that way they can achieve that even faster. Um, but with full frame, I would love for them to at least try to make a departure. And I would love for them to have the DFD algorithm mixed with the phase in the future, because you know we know that phase works or dual pixel works really well with video. But with stills, I mean, they can keep making that algorithm better and better and better. And that deep learning of the camera actually knowing what your subject matter is, I think that that's a play that they can have. So still shooters, you can have the best of both worlds. Let's have DFD for stills and you know the phase with the video. So that way you can make everybody happy. But I don't know. I mean, the article definitely talked about how, you know, their commitment to, you know, just fine tuning an algorithm and they continue to go back to the drawing board and make it better, 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 which we've seen. I mean, look at those initial GH5 autofocus tests to where we're at now in the system. I mean, it's night and day difference and they've just constantly made it better. They've constantly fine tuned the race car and sent it down the track, you know, with firmware updates. So, you know, I definitely think that there is a path for them with both of the technologies. And I hope that, you know, they can get both of the technologies to work together in the future. Yeah. And the buzzword for this, I think, is machine learning or artificial intelligence, depending on how you want to word it, where that's part of why the S5 is better is because they are using machine learning to say this is a face. Even if it turns, it's still a face. Keep that focused. And sorry, turn myself away from the mic is probably not good etiquette here, but uh, it's uh, they, they are using just raw computing power to make up for some of the limitations in the DFD process. And I think that's fascinating that they're they're able to, and I believe that's how Sony cracked the animal eye autofocus is machine learning. It's not the focusing, it's that the camera is smart enough to tell this is an animal, this is its head, this is its eye, focus there. And it sounds like Panasonic is doing the same thing to work around the limitations in DFD. And I, I think it's a great idea in theory, and I hope they get there. But like you, I worry that this is going to hold them up too much, especially in the video market, which is kind of their bread and butter. So we'll see where this one plays out. Absolutely. The rumor roundup. Let's see if we get our little... Our rumor roundup for today. Kicking off Nikon rumors. What do we got here? So the rumor is next week, we've got a couple new and important Z mount lenses coming. Uh, the first one is the 50 millimeter F 1.2. And the second one is the 14 to 24 F 2.8. Um, the 50 F 1.2 feels like entry stakes for full frame cameras nowadays, or at least if you want to show off your new full frame mount, like the huge Z mount has room to make it theoretically easy to build a lens that is F 1.2. Now I'm not a lens designer, so I can say it's easy. Uh, the, and I think this lens is one that they desperately needed because the knocked the manual focus, it was at 56, 58, f 9.5 that's a nice trophy lens but professionals can't use manual focus especially at f 0.95 with that razor thin depth of focus or, or they've you know they, they need to be locked out of the eye for portraits and this 51 2 with autofocus i think is going to be a much more real world usable lens than the knocked and I same with the 14 to 24 the look, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the look and feel of these lenses i mean the size, the balance, I mean, they're, they look super nice. I mean, they, they look pretty sexy. Um, I'm, I'm excited for, and they've both been on display, I think, at camp camera conferences before. So I don't think it's like a, you know, big, it's not like a rumor in that they're not coming. I mean, they've been shown before. Right. Uh, the announcement or the piece of news is that we're finally going to get more information about the launch of these lenses. So we had the 50 and then the 14 to 24, that's going to be an f 2.8 lens, right? 
Right. Yeah. The, the, it seems like an essential lens for real estate photographers and landscape photographers. And it's, it was an obvious hole in the Z mount lineup that they are filling and good for them. They, they needed this in the Z mount. Absolutely. And I can't tell, do you know from any of the other photos, is there filter threads on it or is it bulbous? That's an excellent question. I didn't see anything about that one way or the other. I mean, the admittedly fuzzy pictures we have here uh, from probably one of those aforementioned conferences, it doesn't look bulbous, but I can't say for sure. I think that'd be great if it wasn't. I mean, if it was, you know, that you could actually use filters, especially for landscape photographers, I think that that would be huge for them. Yeah. So let me jump up here. Jim Summer says, oh, they do look sexy. If only my bank account looked that sexy. Uh, <laughs> I hear uh, you there, my friend. Yeah, I, I feel there. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, there looks like there might be another R5. What? That's yeah. The the rumor is that there are photographers who are testing out the R5s, which is twice the megapixels, ninety megapixels of the R5, which it is. You know, the, the, I don't remember what the current. Uh, uh, a7, not A7, I'm getting my camera brands confused, but the S model of their mirrored camera, uh, the Mark, th is it Mark IV S? But whatever it is, I'm going to stop fumbling around. This the is 5D the new... Or the 5D S. That's it. 5D is what I just could not pull out of my brain. Uh, you know, this is their new top-of-the-line high-resolution camera. And 90 pecs megapixels is a pretty jaw-dropping number. I mean, you're creeping up on the medium format 100 megapixel uh, Fuji GFX or maybe even you know a phase one level of resolution on this thing. And with those new fantastic RF mount lenses, they can probably get away with it on this camera. That said, 90 megapixels, I mean, I... I don't know that I want 90 megapixels in my pictures. That's an awful lot of data that I have to be dragging around. So it feels like a niche, but it also feels like a halo product where having this in the line for high-end product photographers, for high-end fashion photographers will make the rest of the line look better. And that feels like a lot of what Canon has been doing with their RF releases is for that halo effect to make the lower end stuff look good as a, oh, you know, someday when I'm a famous fashion photographer, I can get the 90 mega megapixel version. But for now, I'll take the $1,000 RP. Yeah, 100%. And Mike Giuliano says the 90 megapixels certainly caught my attention. And yeah. honestly, so I shot with the um, Fuji GFX 100 um, about three weeks ago. And at first, I was like, I never... I never want this many megapixels. I don't have room for this in my workflow. Um, and the first medium format camera I used was kind of slow as well. Uh, but the 100, the Fuji 100, it was like I was using a traditional SLR. So I think that if, if Canon can keep the speed up, they can write to the cards fast enough. You're not waiting for it to like develop like a Polaroid picture. I think that they could definitely be onto something, especially if they keep it at this size because the GFX 100 is much, much larger. And mm -hmm. if, you know, with the R5, if it's the normal size, even just, it w actually it shouldn't have to be, you know, much bigger. Um, I'm just thinking like astro wise, I'm thinking, you know, for even, I, I'd probably take it to a wedding um, just so I could get my crop ins. Um, I, I mean, depending on the price, I, I might, and I'm, I might purchase a camera like this um, landscapes again, just to have all that raw revolution, you know, that resolution. Um, That's true. I think that they could definitely be onto something here. The only, the next closest thing to be able to achieve this would be the, you know, GFX 100 and it, the price points just under 10 K, which is phenomenal. Right. I mean, I remember when I went to, you know, WPPI six or seven years ago. And, you know, I, that was when I think I first saw my first um, phase back. And then I saw the price and I'm like, I'd have to, I, I, that's more than my house costs. Like right. I, I'm not like for me to get into that system, there's no way. But now the Fuji has brought it down to 10,000. Now I wonder what Canon can do now coming to 90 megapixels in this body form factor. I mean, yep. do you think they can get 5,000 out of it? 
four thousand? What do you think? I'd be I'd be surprised by five thousand since the R five costs what forty five hundred, forty three hundred, somewhere in the mid forties. So I would I mean j- just to pick a number out of thin air, I would guess six, maybe seven. Uh, but I'm I'm just guessing. Uh, but whatever it is, it does feel like it's coming in under that ten thousand dollars of the GFX. So it'll be a deal and. For a lot of people, it'll be a more useful camera. Absolutely. I love Jim Summers. Uh, you should be giving away a free 8-terabyte hard drive with a 90-megapixel <laughs> camera. You know that's right. Yep. It's definitely going to take up yeah, all those 1-terabyte memory cards that you have to put in. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on from there, a 14 to 21 F1.2 or a 1.4? Which one is it? One point. Nope. Oh, checking my notes. One point uh, <laughs> four. Sorry. Yeah. Still, still pretty impressive. Uh, yeah. I have you ever heard of a one point four zoom before of any size and shape? This is the first one I'm aware of. And again, this one and the previous one are rumors. I think this is a rumor based on a patent, but this one feels right. It feels like the kind of thing Canon is pushing at with their RF mount. Again, that halo effect that we're Canon and we are the sleeping giant or we were the sleeping giant, but we're back now and we're going to slap this down on the table. Let's see if you've got anything in your hand that can can beat this. And if they can make this lens, it's going to cost a million billion dollars, and they're only going to make a handful of them, and they're going to sell out instantly. Because, again, the, the people we were discussing up above for the 14 to 24, the landscape photographers, the real estate photographers, this would be their holy grail. I mean, the, the, nobody would be able to afford it, but the people that would would snatch it up. Oh, 100%. I could see where a lens like this would actually bring, I would think that it would bring over, you know, astrophotographers as well, just to have, you know, that, I mean, all those lenses in one, I think that would be freaking phenomenal. Right. Just the light gathering that you could make with this lens on a zoom is mind boggling. Right. And that mixed with that would be, (laughs) that would be a sweet combination. 90 megapixel oh, my, and that my credit card forward. just started weeping thinking about the two of those in combination <laughs> that would be awesome though so let's go ahead and jump into our educational and tutorials block and this is where we try to inspire you to do something fresh something new and get outside your comfort zone so first and foremost the 2020 bird photographer of the year winning images were selected what were your thoughts on some of the finalists um, I mean, as usual, I, I do some amateur bird photography. It's one of my hobbies in the photography world. And I am just blown away by these pictures. I, I just cannot believe the amount of time and effort and skill that must have gone into getting some of these. I mean, that perfect mirror image you see there, how still that water had to be. Uh, it's just just amazing to me. And it's the kind of thing that makes me want to grab my camera and go rushing out to the local park. Absolutely. And and. It's, it's an area that I like really want to get into and I, ha- I have the long enough lenses to do it. I just don't have like location wise. I know there's some great stuff here in Lake Erie, um, but I live an hour south. So it's definitely something that I want to start focusing more on, you know, with, you know, the migrations and stuff coming through here. I see people's bird photography and I'm like, I want that so bad. Like, especially there was recently, you know, a bird that it was the first time it was ever in Ohio. Like, yep. so some of that stuff is, you know, right place at the right time. But like an image like this, I mean, it looks like fine art. You know what I mean? Yep. It's just so beautiful. So if you need some inspiration for your bird photography, uh, some people ask, you know, hey, how do we get access to these links? Like, I can't click on that screen. Uh, if you go to our website, thepixelconnection.com, and just click on the sign up on our web- website, it gets sent out every Friday at 6 o'clock. So you'll be able to you know, click on that and they'll be emailed directly to you. Yeah, and I have two so, more comments uh, on the bird photography side. Uh, the first is for finding places. I used to be into bird watching, uh, you know, as well as bird photography. And your local bird watching groups will know where the stuff is. And or if, like, if you head up to Cuyahoga Valley National Park, chat up the ranger. They'll know where the good bird spots are. So that's a good way to find, you know, if there's a local park person there, talk to them too. That'll help you find the hot spots for the birds. 
Um, and the second thing is you mentioned that you have a long enough lens. My experience with bird photography is you never have a long enough lens. You always want That's more. True. That's <laughs> absolutely true. <laughs> and if, if uh, I can definitely tell you where not to ask for uh, tips, and that is me. So I told Mr. Jim Summers, I was like, oh, yeah, there's this park. There's this waterfowl park. Um, and from what he found, it was a waterfowlless park. So uh, don't ask me for any tips on where to find the coolest birds, especially out in my neck of the woods, because I have no clue at all. <laughs> so I, another thing that I had no clue about was that there was a competition for minimalist photography. And this might be my new favorite genre. After looking yep. at some of these photos, like I love the simplicity and at first I'm like, this isn't minimal. It's very, it's, you know, it's confusing. Like this busy, it's the photo so, so busy on the right hand side. But then as I looked at it in the framing, I mean, there's just no distraction. I, I just think it's such a cool, like just a cool set of photos. And it made me kind of think about like next time I see like that one there, that's like a building um, could be a gas station. I don't know. Um, but just to look for those things just out in the, you know, just out in the world, because I don't know, it was just super captivating looking through some of these, the winners of this. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I tend to be drawn to shape and color, especially color in pictures. So just looking at these and their use of color is amazing. I mean, and, and the one on the left, if you know people can see our, see the video and are watching now with the red circular hat, I was looking at that for like 30 seconds where I figured out that there was actually a person wearing a hat underneath there. It's just so eye-catching. And and it's also, it's impressive that they have the eye to take something that would, you know, you might just be this very boring picture and to make it so dynamic with so little going on in them. So that's what I try to take away from this is, you know, looking at these and try to figure out, well, what did they see and what can I look for the next time I'm out there and I see something that catches my eye? How can I make it more than just a snapshot and make it something as beautiful as these pictures? Right. And it seems like simplicity is key. Moving on from there, do you really need a lens hood, Mike? So I have different answers to this, but I wanted to throw this out to anybody who's on the chat with us. Do you use a lens hood? If so, why or why not? Because I actually have two answers. Is for my zooms, like on my uh, camera right here, for whatever reason, I always leave the lens hood on. I like the extra protection it gives, uh, and it's already kind of big, so what's a little bit extra length on my zoom? Uh, I'll, I'll take the extra protection, thanks. But when I'm out doing city photography, when I'm taking my camera out you know, to downtown Cleveland or wherever, I never use a lens hood. I want the small, unobtrusive lens on the small, unobtrusive camera, and there's something about lens hood that just shouts photographer. So I, I can kind of see both, both sides of it for when I do and when I don't. What about you, TJ? Do you use a lens hood? Yeah, so we get this question a lot, and the article talks about this too, like what are some technical reasons that you need to use a lens hood? And first and foremost is to keep those, you know, the sun rays out of your lens element. Um, otherwise, what will happen is you'll get this, the light will hit the sensor and you get this, like it just blows out your contrast. Like you won't have contrast in the scene as much because it'll look kind of hazy. Um, but anytime I'm shooting a wedding, absolutely. Like it's, you know, my I wear a dual camera strap, the hold fast strap. Um, so my cameras are always kind of bouncing around. Uh, so I definitely have a you know lens hood on those just to make sure you know that I don't bump into things. It's more for the bumping in and protection than it is for any you know image you know considerations. Uh, outside of that, like if I'm shooting you know landscape, if I'm shooting like out in the city, um, not really. I mean it's coming out of my bag and right on the camera, um, so I'm less likely to you know put a lens hood on there. Uh, that being said, I did just order a uh, metal lens hood for my X100V, um, one part style, two part protection. So just <laughs> making sure that, you know, that lens element does stay protected. So, you know, that's a camera that is meant to be a take everywhere and just throw in your bag kind of lens So or camera. Um, so that one, like very specifically, like I wanted some protection on it. Um, but yeah. Unless I'm doing like another option, I guess would be like I'm trying to think through all these things. Like if I'm doing a backlit photo, um, 
like if I'm doing like portraits up against the, you know, the sun in the back, I might. Um, but I also sometimes like the creative lens flare. So again, I definitely urge you to, you know, try the lens hood to see if it's something that, you know, works for you creatively, but also protects your gear. So uh, let's see what our audience members have to say. Sorry, two screens here. Um, yes, about 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, Jim, is that in your commercial, the commercial work that you're doing like out with the barrel racing, um, or is that just in general? No matter what it is you're shooting, you know, you have it on there. Uh, Brett Gidding says, always shooting outside against the sun is a must or children photography helps with the little hands. Absolutely, I can see where it would definitely be. Kind of that block yeah. there. You know, yeah. Self-defense so. is a large part of why I keep, is when I keep the lens hood on. So I wanted to make, uh, shoot, I had two things I wanted to say about your comments is, well, one is, yes, those square lens hoods for the Fuji X100Vs, those are pretty sexy. So I, that might be a case where I would put one on regardless. And two, I am so jealous of the hold fast straps. I made the mistake of following their Instagram after one of our earlier live sessions with someone who was uh, one of their associate photographers. And, oh, those things are gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> I want one, even though I have no need for the dual sling look. I, oh man! <laughs> Mike Giuliano says sometimes I feel like I like the effect of not having it on sometimes. So yes, it's definitely a creative choice. Yeah. And then Jim Summers says yes, he has it on all the time due to the environment that he is in. So um, some good feedback, um, and that helps us too at the store when people ask like, "What is this lens cap or this lens hood for?" You know, we love telling, you know, real world stories of how you guys use them uh, to, you know, help them make better informed decisions. Moving on from there, we have, I just wanted to remind everybody, we do have our Pixel Photo Fest coming up. It's right around the corner, only about 318 sleeps left <laughs> until that happens. Uh, so, yeah, that's coming at you July 27th through 29th, 2021. Uh, hopefully COVID free and we can do it in person again. We do urge you to jump over and take your uh, click on that register now button so you can be registered. We have about 205 registered so far. Uh, so it's looking like it's going to be a pretty awesome event. Uh, and if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to us at social at the pixel And we'll be a little hey, more hey, than happy. To answer I've any got questions. a question. Yes. Sir. So do I remember correctly that having a registration for this year's photo fest gives you one for next year's automatically because yeah. otherwise I need to go out and sign up. Like Flynn. Yep. Yes. 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 So if you did get a 2020 ticket, you are automatically rolled over to 2021. Excellent. Thank you. Absolutely. Moving on from there. I wanted to remind you guys too, that we've been just pumping out some content. You can see our, uh, Fuji film, um, X1 or X the XF 50 millimeter videos up there. We were hands on with the S5. All these live streams are all going to our YouTube channel. So if you could do us a favor, head over to youtube.com slash the pixel connection. We are that close to 2000 subs. We really want to get there. That's like one of our big milestones. So if you could do us a favor and head over there and subscribe, uh, again, we put out, you know, two videos a week, uh, sometimes three. So uh, definitely follow along with us there. Um, if you want a little bit more in-person love, we do have a ton of classes up on our um, up on our website. If you go to thepixelconnection.com and click on events, you'll see all of our in-store classes. I know Mike Giuliano has been in for uh, the lighting one. Um, a couple other um, people that I see in the chat have been as well. So uh, we urge you, if you do want to learn something new or you just want to fine tune you know, a skill, that's a great way to do it. Um, Mike Giuliano, uh, should we have seen an email for the 2021 ticket yet? Uh, no, that'll be closer to the event when we start sending out everybody's um, the reminders for it and stuff like that. Um, so you can expect an email, but we got you. I know that you're on the list. You're good to go. So are you on the list for any of these groups? So we have a few little user groups that we help maintain and do you know, fun challenges and things. Uh, number one is the Midwest Lumix user group. So that is all the Panasonic Lumix lovers that are out there. Um, nice little group of um, basically like-minded individuals. That's our goal with these is to you know, just facilitate and share the love for these brands. Uh, we have the Ohio Fuji fam, the Olympus users. So, uh, 
Uh, if you want to join in these, definitely go over to Facebook, that's where they live, and just type in as you see them on the screen and join your fellow camera lovers. And you know, I know Mike and I are both uh, heavily engaged in the Ohio Fuji fam, uh, but I also share some photos in the other ones as you know, I've shot those previously as well. So uh, you don't have to just pick one. It's not like you have to pick a tribe. It's not like Horde versus the Alliance if you're a World of Warcraft player. You know, this, you can be in all of them. It's fine, uh, but definitely go take a look at those. So if you're wondering, you know, how you can get the slides today, the easiest way is to go over to our website, thepixelconnection.com, and on the bottom right-hand corner, click on the link that says subscribe, and you'll get a link to all of the articles in your inbox every single Friday. Um, Real quick, we had a couple of comments that came in, so I want to address those. We need a Northeast Ohio astrophotography user group. Wow. I might work on that today. Uh, rodeo photography. <laughs> that seems a it little might, more specialized. It might just be you in there. No, I know there are a lot of other rodeo photographers, and actually there's quite a few people that want to learn about rodeo photography. So um, that's a very good example. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate you jumping in there. So if you do have any other questions, there is all of our contact information here at the store. Mr. Vrobel, where can people find you online? You can find my food photography and writing at dadcooksdinner.com or find me at dadcooksdinner on most of the socials. Excellent. And if you need to get a hold of me, you can find me on Instagram at underscore TJ Houston. Everywhere else, just do a Google search for TJ Houston. I promise you will find me. Well, I don't know about you, Mr. Vrobel, but I feel like it's time to focus on the weekend. Thank you so much for your time today. It was greatly appreciated. You're welcome. Bye, everybody. Have a good week, everybody. We'll see you.